cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance here by heavy snow the sigh has slipped and all I cannot really figure out how anything in this world could be more exciting than Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it's not a crime uh, to go hunting or fishing or do anything like that, but, but I, I just can't figure out uh, how any of these things, uh, chasing a ball or video games or big trucks, are more exciting than Jesus. Uh, these things can be fun. But there's nothing that's more thrilling than the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's nothing more stimulating to the soul, to the mind, to the heart than Jesus Christ. And I also struggle to understand something else. And that is who would turn down eternal life in favor of eternal punishment. I, I just can't figure that out. And, um, you know, when I, when I became a Christian, I remember going to some of my family who... Uh, professed a, a, a thin veneer of Christianity and I'm like I asked him well why, why didn't you ever tell me about this and uh, this is the most wonderful thing and now I realize it's because they didn't know they just had no clues a thin veneer of religiosity if you will I never understood how anyone would refuse everlasting joy or everlasting peace and prefer instead uh, misery or pain I, I just can't understand that and uh, by the way FYI modern sermon experts or church growth gurus would not recommend me starting a message out this way you know but but why is it you know that why is it though that throughout the redemptive history there's there's this pattern in, in history of people rejecting the gospel I just don't understand. I have long contemplated that. And, and I do not believe that the issue is the gospel message. 
I do not believe the issue is the skill of the person or man proclaiming it. Charles Spurgeon was converted under a coal miner preacher who Spurgeon uh, would later said this man was very illiterate in the scriptures. But he said one word, look unto the Lord and be saved. And Spurgeon was baptized and saved. So it doesn't take that either, the skill. So, so what is it? Why is it that people reject this wonderful thing? And, and, and it's because of one reason. It's because of the condition of mankind's heart. The depth of human depravity. Prove it. We will. Please meet me in Luke 8. Rather extensive text. Verses 4 through 15. When a large crowd was coming together, and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Verse 8, other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. And as he said these things, that's Jesus, he would call out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And Jesus said in verse 10, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to the rest, it is in parables. So that seeing they may not see. And hearing, they may not understand. Verse 11, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart. So they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no firm root. They believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. Verse 14, the seed which fell among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard. And as they go on their way, they're choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. Verse 15, but the seed in the good soil. These are the ones who've heard the word in an honest and a good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. May God bless the reading of his word. And now we pray, Father, to you through our Lord Jesus Christ, our Father who art in heaven. Such rich gems there, dear Lord, of your mercy and of your compassion that we can cry out to you through the Holy Spirit, Abba, Father, Father. But knowing that you are in heaven, in the divine realm of existence, upon the throne of God, around the sea of glass, with the cherubim and the burning ones, around your throne, with fire and lightning coming from your throne, throne, and it reminds us that we are on mere earth and we are so far from you that there's a reverence, Father. And we are so thankful that through Jesus Christ we can approach the throne of grace. Thank you for this time. Lord, give us ears to hear. I pray, dear Lord, for your help that Christ would be exalted in his sinless name. Amen.
It's a heavy text here this morning. And Isaiah chapter 48 verse 11 tells us that the Lord is going to share his glory with no other. He's just not going to do it. And uh, in regards to establishing the context of this passage, it's important and instructive that we also compare this text to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13 is the parallel account to this and Matthew gives us actually a little bit more information as to kind of what's going on here. This is still the Galilean ministry of Jesus here. It's coming to kind of an end. He's going to be going about and doing other things. But he's near the Sea of Galilee. Matthew tells us that in this account that there was all kinds of people. This was probably the height of the Galilean ministry. He was becoming very popular. His ultimate crescendo of popularity would be uh, that Palm Sunday of entering in. Hoshiana, Hoshiana, the palm branches. But then that final week, as Dr. R.C. Foster has so beautifully described in his book, that final week became a disaster. But in man's eyes. But... Um, here it's becoming very popular so he's he's near the Sea of Galilee Matthew 13 tells us that that actually Jesus got into a little boat as he's giving this discourse and kind of spread out a little bit from the seashore to kind of give him some distance as he was able to speak between him and the people that's interesting so 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 it gives us rich insight Matthew chapter 13 but then Luke tells us back in Luke Luke tells us though in verse 4 really something very important to see here that, that these different villages and that these different cities were still coming to Jesus here so we have a mass group a, a, a crowd that that's massively coming to hear this message and to hear him no doubt though that, that there's many spectators involved here that's coming with all kinds of twisted motives and, and you know, coming because of the supernatural miracles that he had been doing. He'd raised the, 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 the widow of Nain's son, so, so that probably was a reason why they were coming and to see the miracles and the demoniacs getting healed. So there was all kinds of, of reasons why they were coming to Jesus, maybe to receive healing for their bunion. But the point is, the Lord is speaking here by way of a parable, a parabole, literally a throwing along the side of here, a story, uh, a it, was, it was employed, uh, common rhetoric skills employed by the rabbis. It's very Jewish in its nature, but it doesn't get any more Jewish than Jesus. So what do you expect? He's speaking here in this parable. Some of these parables were really uh, just brief illustrations, but some of them were extensive analogies, like the one we're going to look at this morning. And it's, it's quite phenomenal, and it makes the story more interesting. It makes the, the story have a little bit of relish on the dog, if you will. There's a little bit of zeal with the story by throwing in that, that parable, uh, a para is alongside of, it's like a paralegal works alongside of an attorney, so a parable is a story alongside of a story. Tongue twister. And really, though, from here on out, these parables is all that he's going to use. So we might as well go ahead and get used to it because we're going to see a lot of it. And, uh, but, but Jesus' parables, though, was something that, that was like, and I'm not going to go in this deeply, but it's really an act of judgment. Really, the way that he spoke when these parables were always an act of judgment. I mean, my goodness, Israel could not even recognize their own Mashiach, their own Messiah. They couldn't even recognize him and they couldn't even understand him. So, he, he's going to tell a parable to the crowds, but the... But there's a private interpretation here that, that we need to understand because the private interpretation of the parable only is those and for those who belong to him. Verse 9 and 10. His disciples. It's for them. The parabole, the parable, is not for the satanic rejectors of the gospel. It's for the disciples. The others really could have cared less. Can you prove that? Verse 10. Verse 10 tells us that the others didn't give 
no attention at all to really to what, what's going on here. So there it is. So point number one, the parable. Verses five through eight. So what we're going to see here, go ahead and understand this. Four kinds of hearts are going to be described here this morning. This is a universal application for what's going on in every church all around the world right now as we speak. Four different hearts are being described. All right? So there's a universal application here. So right now, you and I need to go ahead and just say, hey man, let's just go ahead and let ourselves know that this is for me and that this is for you right here this morning. We don't need to spoon feed this off to our neighbor. It's a parable of caution and there's priority one within this and that is be careful how we hear. All right, that's what's going on here. You got a simple story describing a, a real life activity. It's not real hard to understand. Uh, the, uh, Galilee was a major agricultural environment. It wasn't flat land. It was a lot of hills, but it was still very rich in its agriculture. So it's possible that as the Lord's in that little John boat there, he's looking around and he may very well be seeing a sower as he's giving this example. It's a common thing. And um, walking up and down these plowed fields, just scattering the seed. So that's what we need to understand. The, these, these seeds, um, as they hit the ground, okay, these seeds are going to hit four different types of soil. So look at verse 5. Understanding the parable is going to be an important if we're going to do a proper interpretation. All right? Observation like Sherlock Holmes, always comes before interpretation. So that's, I'm going to be faithful to the text and then teach it in that manner. So verse 5, some of the seed fell beside the road. It's not a highway. It's not what we're talking about here. There was these unplowed little paths where people would cut through the farmer's fields and walk, just little trails, but it was hard-packed soil. People stepped on it with their feet and it was supper for the birds. Right? Moving on. Second, Look at verse 6. Some of the other seed fell on rocky soil. So the plow didn't hit it. You may not even see that rock underneath there, but it was an underlying rock bed of soil. And what, what's going on here is, is, is obviously the roots cut, wouldn't cut through that. So man, this thin layer of little topsoil didn't, didn't do anything. It didn't support it, and it withered. Third, moving on, verse 7. You like how I'm moving fast. Verse 7, the other seed fell among the thorns. These were prickly, useless threats to the farmer. And uh, very, very, very harmful. And my goodness, do they grow fast. Um, and, and what happens is they block the sunlight from the others. And, uh, and as a result, they, they choke out the good plants. But, but it's, 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 it's kind of interesting because as a result of the, the soil, it looks good at first when it's being sown. Um, but the tragedy reality going on here is that there was some type of other life going on within, within this one. Number verse eight, fourth, some seed managed uh, to fall on some good soil and it grew up and it produced a crop a hundred times as great. So this one is uh, soft soil. It's deep, and it's free of weeds. And it, uh, it produces something that even the farmer couldn't even figure out. He uses the word hundred times there, and, and literally what he's talking about is, is like, this is so much food, I don't even know what to do with it. It's almost too much. Think about that as we move forward. So it was a wonderful crop, wonderful crop. Number two, now we can look to the interpretation. Point number two is the interpretation. And, um, you, you know, well, you probably didn't even have to do all that. You could have just went to the interpretation in verses 8 through 15. But, um, well, you, you know, you saved some time there and went straight to the interpretation. Well, let me answer that critic real quick here. Once again, you, you can't interpret what you don't see. So, 
that kind of remark might come from one who may not have a desire to understand the parable and that's why Jesus called out here what he said he would call out he who has ears to hear let him hear so this is the full entirety of what the Lord is saying here it was really a challenge that Jesus is saying and then the challenge is a distinction is a desired distinction here between those who really desire to understand and, and those those who, who don't. So the point is, is that the disciples, the pupils or the students, uh, they desired to understand. And look at verse 10. That's why Jesus said, well, it's going to be granted for you to understand the mysteries of heaven. You desire to get this. And uh, that's the evidence of a disciple. Everyone else, verse 10, and he quotes Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9. And uh, he says, everyone else is blind as a bat and deaf. And that's something that Isaiah said. And Jesus is just saying, hey, this is the fulfillment of that. Every time that Isaiah passage is mentioned is a, is a picture of when people hear the word of God. That's its context. Isaiah 6, 9 is, is not preaching. Isaiah 6, 9 is how we hear. And hearing is not passive. It takes work to hear properly. It's like reading a book. It's a, it's, it involves effort to hear. It's like a, a baseball catcher catching the ball. If anything's passive, it's the baseball. There's nothing passive in the catcher catching the ball. I mean, man, he's got to look out for a bunt. He's got to you know, call the play. He's got a lot to do. It's a very important position. And the catcher is the one hearing. So... Jesus interprets in verse 11. He says, the seed is the word of God. Now, I'm not, in this, in this context, once again, the sower is, is not the issue here. We're, we're talking about the seed, the, the, the pure seed. We're not talking about fake seed. We're not talking about processed seed. We're not talking about any type of artificial seed. We're not talking about uh, Bill Gates' synthetic seed. We're talking about the pure seed, the, the pure divine seed, which is the inerrant, infallible, indestructible Word of God. As Brother Jeff talked about, the, 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 the very thunderbolt from heaven, the double-edged sword. We're not talking about a pointless dart here. We're talking about something that's going to penetrate the thoughts and hearts of sinful man. The pure and adulterated word of God. And when that is proclaimed in its purity by preaching through verses of the Bible accompanied with the Holy Spirit, it's going to do one of two things to an individual. It's going to break an individual or it's going to harden an individual. There's no middle ground. And that's what we need. We need more true expository preaching of the divine seed. That's why there's so many fake conversions today because what's happened across our land in the West, particularly uh, the land of the free and home of the de de depraved, what's taken place here is that we have altered the gospel message. And I would say sermonettes make Christianettes. And we have a lot of adult people in the church still singing that little cute wee little Zacchaeus song that they sung in Bible school. Well, if you want to hang your hat on the wee little Zacchaeus song, then you might be a wee little Christian. Because God commands that we grow. So we're going to look at the soils. I've come up with my own names for the soils. And we're going to look at those now. So verse 12 is what I call the wayside hearers. Look at verse 12. The wayside hearers. Those beside the road are those who have heard. And then the devil, underlined devil. It's the only one that mentions that this one is, is totally satanic in its essence. The devil comes and takes away the word from their heart and so that they will not believe and be saved. So this is, this is what I call the wayside hearers. This is those individuals that, that have heard but they just will flat out reject it. 
literally. Now, the Old Testament refers to them in Psalm 95.8 as hard-hearted. They've got a very hard heart. Proverbs 28.14 and Deuteronomy, Torah 10.16, 2 Kings 17.4, Nehemiah 9.29, Jeremiah 7.26 refers to them as stiff-necked. So the concept of conviction for these folks and self-examination and an honest assessment of guilt and repentance are afterthoughts. They're wayside hearers. What would I tell them? Well, I would tell them that they don't need to be aware of God's presence because they have not God. They need to be aware of the devil's presence. They don't understand who the devil is. They've been engulfed in Hollywood. They don't understand anything. But before I would teach them about who God is, I would teach them who the devil is. And the reason why I say that is because the devil's presence in their life as they're hearing the Bible. The most important thing that could ever take place in their life is not community public school, is not middle school, is not high school, is not French class or Spanish class or basketball or deer hunting or whatever the case may be. The most important thing in an individual's life is hearing the Word of God. Not Josh, not Danny, God. What happens to these folks is the devil, Jesus said, comes and takes away the word from their heart. I'm here to tell you, he is seeking to destroy your soul. And if he doesn't attack you all through the week, then I assure you this, he's attacking these people right now as I speak. The devil is present. And more so even here in a congregation. He labors hard, friend, to stop the progress of that which is good. Anything he can do to keep you from experiencing salvation, anything. And the wayside hearers often come to church. <clears throat> there's, there's these wondering thoughts. There's... There's dull memories, there's lost minds, and sermons are dull, and there's just this major distracted attention, and they're kind of fidgety, you know, that they're weary eyes and they're sleepy. And I'm not picking on you, but I'm trying to get you to see that the devil's behind it all. It's too hot outside. It's too cold outside. It's raining outside. It's too warm outside. There's, there's, it's, it's too damp outside. There's snow outside. And all these are great reasons for the wayside here not to come to church. They forget all the sermons. But most importantly, most importantly, they forget who the devil is. As the birds have this seed for supper. So too, sadly, these people are getting their lunch ate by Satan and don't even realize it. The enemy is Satan. Be on guard. Number two, verse 13. These are the warm admirers. The warm admirers. These people have favorite preachers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those on the rocky soil are those when they hear. They receive the word with joy. And these have no firm root. They believe for a little while, a time of temptation, they fall away. So there's nothing there that remains except for this, this uh, shallow, this, this, this stony ground. I'm calling them the warm admirers because they, they have favorite preachers. They, they like preaching. And, and it, it, it's a picture of a uh, superficial, you know, superficial profession. Because really they're totally opposite from the wayside hearer. These people are, are engaged. Uh, they, they, in fact, they get mad at the wayside hearer. Look at him over there playing on their phone. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you shouldn't be playing on your phone. You should be paying attention to the Word of God. 
Um, but the point is, okay, the, the, the warm admirers are totally opposite because they receive the word. In fact, they receive it with joy. You know, and, and hear it proclaimed and, and, and receiving it with joy. So there's this euphoria <clears throat> with these people. There's this euphoria and oftentimes that may convince others that they're truly converted. Now, they manifest a, a great zest and zeal for the Lord. And that's wonderful. The, these joyful e <clears throat> expressions, they're, they're exhilarated. There's a sense of exuberancy here. And, and, and these are all wonderful things. But the issue is, is they have no firm root. So they only believe for a little while. It's surface level. And as J.C. Ryle says, it's nothing more than animal excitement. And how often do we see this all around? With just, you know, someone raising their hands. It is not an expression of their conversion, as important as that is. Now, we need some of that zeal, okay? But at the same token, we have to be well balanced and understand that, that we, you know, excitement and, and, and affections and peace are all wonderful things and joy and zeal, they're beautiful. In fact, the, the fourth soil is going to manifest these things too. Okay, but, but still, these marks in and of themselves are not a mark of one's conversion. They're expressions of one's conversion. You can have expressions and still be a stony ground hearer. They're warm admirers. These are the good upright citizens. They, 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 they never miss church. But oftentimes, these people are really uncomfortable around those who are truly on fire for God. They get a little bit nervous. If you start talking about any type of Greek or Hebrew or, or knowledge of apologetics or something like that, they're like, well, I, you know, I've got the Holy Spirit. I don't really need any of that. Well, so they don't truly follow Christ in a sense because it's a surface level. So it's like they come to the cross when they're immersed, okay, but they don't pick up the cross. And both are necessary to get saved and remain saved. So they found Christ's teachings just to be a little bit too intense. The true nature of his salvation, the true nature of his calling, which he demands total commitment and, and allegiance to him. They don't like that. So they found that kind of unacceptable. And they have really permanently abandoned the Lord. Because they just refuse to go deep with the Lord. They refuse. That's for those people there. But it's not for me. It's, it's the, was it John 6? Um, the the, the would-be disciples were there. And what happened in John uh, chapter 6? Uh, the first 12 or 13 verses there, it, Jesus literally said about these would-be disciples that they withdrew and were no longer following him because they just wanted bread. They wanted to, just to get to eat food. So there's no deep humbling, there's no mortification of sin, there's no heart union with the Lord, and there's no lordship. Point number three is uh, the worldly wise men. Obviously my character here comes from the great John Bunyan's classic uh, as, as Christian is told by evangelist, uh, the great allegory book here, Pilgrim's Progress, Christian, the man is told by evangelist to go straight towards the light and the gate and don't veer off the path. And there's Bunyan walking with this backpack of burden, wanting to relieve his burden, which is a picture of sin. And it isn't long after he falls into the, the sloth of despond that he comes to this character named Worldly Wiseman who's seeking to get him off of this dirt path with thorns and rocks on it that's not appealing at all and follow this rainbow path and come over here and have some fun. And that Christian does it. And then he realizes what's taken place and what this is really all about. But the point is, so I'm gleaning off of that character because that defines verse 14, this thorny soil. And uh, the, the character comes and uh, obviously from the Pilgrim's Progress. But, but the only book, the only book that worldly wise men reads is, his, is a book called Self-Advancement. He doesn't read the Bible. He reads a book and it's titled Self-Advancement because it defines who he is. 
it, it, or, or it's, it's a self-seeking, self-satisfied church culture that we live in today. And that's why a lot of my messages are despised because it's not about self, it's about God. And, and these individual only stands with those who really uphold his own strong thinking and views. So, you know, it, these, you know, but, but, but these two have, have heard and really indeed accepted it. So they've been immersed. Um, but, but then the, the, the pleasure comes in in their life, whatever that pleasure may be. And then James chapter 1 verse 8 says that they're double-minded. They're, they're double-minded. They've got one foot in the baptistry and one foot in justified land. And Nuri, what's happening is sanctification land because they're hanging out in Disneyland. It's a plague and a pandemic of the heart. And they need something stronger than a vaccine. They need the blood of Jesus through repentance. Matthew 6, 24 says, you cannot serve God and wealth. So we need to go ahead and decide here which one we're going to serve. Yeah, we've got to make money to survive. Okay, but, but you know, which one are you going to do? Because, see, being made in the image of God literally means that our hearts are only designed to embrace one all-encompassing devotion. As Bonhoeffer said, the great Lutheran pastor, we're either going to serve God and hate the world or we're going to hate the world and love God. So these individuals are consumed with temporal things, longings and desires of the heart, their career, their homes, their cars, their prestige, their relationships, their fame, and the list could go on and on and on. God help us. And this is where we all got to be careful because we all could fall into this one. We could fall into any of them. But... Um, they have no objection to doctrine. They believe in all the doctrines we proclaim. In fact, they understand that these are the first ones that are going to say the Lord requires obedience. They understand that. They understand the Lord makes requirements. And even they wish to obey, I believe. But they hear many sermons and they agree. But then they go about their week, but there's still no spiritual fruit. It's the same old thing over and over and over and over again, and nothing ever changes. Why? Why? Because something of the world has their heart, and they're changing. There's no room for the Word of God. There's no room for prayer meetings. That is a complete laughing joke. There's no room for any of that because you got it filled up with something of the world. J.C. Ryle says this, quote, The things of this life form one of the greatest dangers which beset a Christian's path. The money, the pleasures, the daily business of the world are so many traps that catch his souls. Thousands of things which in themselves are innocent become, when followed to excess, little better than soul poisons and helps to hell. Open sin is not the only thing that ruins souls. In the midst of our families, and in the pursuit of our lawful callings, we have need to be on our guard, except we watch and pray. These temporal things will rob us of heaven and smoother every sermon we hear. Smother, excuse me. We may live and die thorny ground hearers. Close quote. So true. My last point, and I'll be done, is the will of Yahweh. It's the only positive one in the group. You can call it the will of Yahweh or... Yeah. 
verse 15. <laughs> this one here, and like I said in verse 8, when we, we were looking at the parable, uh, in verse 8 it says that this one produces a crop a hundredfold, literally. I want to reemphasize this. In, in, the, in the Greek language there, what Luke is saying is, is like I said, it's too much crop. You, it's honestly, you're just too, too much to handle. And of the exception of my mom and Bobby, my stepdad, and a few others, a few others, I think that's the majority of what my family wanted. They wanted Josh to get off drugs and alcohol and all this, okay? They wanted Josh to get his life cleaned up and, and, and get on this path of morality. But they sure didn't want Josh to become a preacher. Well, how do you know that? Well, not necessarily by what they say, but by what they don't say. I ain't talked to him in six or seven years, ten years. I want nothing to do with him. Are you bitter about that? No, I, I pray for them. But at the same token, this crop of a hundredfold, okay, is overbearing to these people. And some of you know exactly what that's like. So in contrast to the first three, though, this is a genuine uh, born again -y. This one here. And glory to God. Soft. The Lord's made me soft. I think about Alex. Kid used to fight everyone in prison. He was a, he could fight. He said to me one time, he said, the Lord's made me soft. He said, I don't think I would ever fight anyone. I said, well, you better not. This soil's soft, it's deep. It's free of weeds. It's luscious. Precious. Doesn't mean you're always batting 100%. But man, there's been a true change in your life. This guy or this woman here has truly been transformed. The seed of the gospel is sinking down, down and down deep into their, their will. Notice that I said will, because it's activated. You got the green light, go. And uh, they, they hear it with pleasure, man. They absolutely love it. I think about some of you here just, you know, you don't, I don't see your eyes because you're, you're just writing down things as fast as your little pen and quill will move. You're eating it up. You long for it. They hear it with pleasure, but, but there's, an act, there's an action with a decision. It's like the old story of the guy hearing all these sermon points, and after the preacher would get to the first point, Jeff, he would run out of the building. And the second week, the preacher would get to his first point again, and Alan, he'd run out of the building. And then finally, the preacher said, why do you always leave, man? You never even hear the sermons. He said, well, you gave one point, and I got to go practice it. Put it into practice. <laughs> they understand the word, man. They accept it. They hold on to it. Unlike the warm admirers, the seed penetrates. Outcome, spiritual fruit. Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Right? A little child in me there. There's actions. Actions, man. Colossians 1.10 So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Please Him. I want to be pleasing to Him. Bearing fruit in every good work. Here you go. And increasing in the knowledge of God. I want to gain as much as I can. Why? So I can love him more. So the variable is the heart, friend. That's the thing to remember. The variable is the heart. Always is. 
And uh, it's not the nature of the heart. I've heard some say, well, it's the nature of the heart. That's not what's being talked about here. Because in the Lord's analogy, all the soils are made up of the same dirt. So it's not the nature of the heart here. Okay, it's the determining factor of how are you going to respond. That's what this is about. How are you going to respond to the gospel, man? Well, I've already initially responded. And... The, the, the factors how we respond and, and then it's influences you know that prevail upon and dominate the heart that conviction is there well then it's the door wedge if you're not going to do anything with the conviction then it's just as useless as a little piece of wooden wedge that props the door open get that wedge of conviction out of there man take it to the Lord take it to the right source Stop trying to cover yourself with your own fig leaves, man, and get under the skin garments. Get under the Lord's provision. So when we actually respond to the conviction and obey God's plan of salvation, then the Spirit's work of regeneration takes place. The death portal, the watery grave... The Holy Spirit working with the Word. And as Roberta put in the scrapbooks of the list of, I'm the 17th preacher that you all have had here. Okay, and under all those preachers, most of them didn't last more than three years, except for the exception of a few. Praise God. But still, the, Roberta put at the top of that, Romans chapter 10, verse 14, how are they going to hear without a preacher? So the preaching ministry, obviously we're all little preachers, or should be. But still, this is an important aspect of what we do. But even then, the preaching today has no Bible. It's loud thunder. I want to close with a quote from John Owen. He said, quote, Those who would have their souls justified by grace must have their sins judged by the law. Better preach the law too, buddy. It's not just some dead, outdated thing. Yeah, fulfilled through Christ. Okay, but, but what is the law? Well, G the New Testament teaches that the law is our tutor, our schoolmaster that brings us to Jesus Christ. Only then will that hard soil be plowed. Only then will the weeds be removed. Only then is the rocks going to be stirred up. And only then... Law and gospel preached. Will those that bear spiritual fruit be dripping with luscious, delicious fruit? So the question is, what soil are you? And that's something that doesn't involve a Bible degree because each one of us know exactly which one we are. It's a no-brainer. Father, I pray and thank you, dear Lord, for your word. Father, it truly is the milk that satisfies. The meat that nourishes. Thank you, dear Lord. I ask and pray above all, Lord, that we would take these things to heart and put action into our belief that all men may know that we are your disciples for our love for you and our love for our neighbor. In Jesus' name, amen.